Minister Christ is, has established uh, as part of what he's called us into initially in, in the community. And <clears throat> thank you for that. I think we take a lot of these things for granted that we just kind of naturally do these things. And if it's not for not just God's purposes, but through his power and his authority and for his will to be accomplished, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. I mean, none of these things actually have a, a whole lot of value if they're not rooted in the truth, if not rooted in what God has said or what God is doing or what God has desired. And so, uh, thanks for that. Uh, last week, Mark, uh, I, grew, I grew a little bit in a good way. I find I'm growing a lot lately and I don't like that good, that's not a good way. But anyway, um, <clears throat> so this weekend we're on uh, week nine uh, of our core value series and it's multiplication. Now this is going to sound kind of similar to some of the other messages and these things should naturally dovetail together because as as God has called us into into the the, the kingdom and has called us into activity within it a lot of things naturally will or supernaturally will go together real well and so this is this is actually going to sound quite a bit like Mother's Day so were you guys here on Mother's Day? Yeah, Mother's Mother's Day was uh, it was it wasn't not necessarily about mothers. <laughs> we included mothers because I don't like to have those holidays where it's like if you're not a mom, just you can check out, doesn't matter. And so this is going to sound a little bit like that message, but uh, having a little bit different emphasis on it. But but this morning, um, if you have a, a Bible in front of you, and there's some in the the, the chairs. Uh, Chair, chair, I won't say chair backs, but the chair underneath. Uh, this morning we're going to be looking in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. And this is kind of addressing the idea of, of, of discipleship and moving into legacy. So if you, are you a parent in this room right now? A parent is somebody, right? And if you're a parent in this room right now, what you're doing is very indicative of what your life is about. So, right? I mean... What you're doing right now kind of shows some insight into the life that you're leading. And so our lives really matter. They, they really matter on how we live them, how we portray them to be, and what we're actively doing in them. And so, um, <clears throat> you know, there's a lot of families that you can kind of point to and say there's some lineage or there's some, some legacy there. But a lot of them don't last very long. Because they'll get to a certain generation and then, then things just kind of fall apart. Like, they had a good run. <laughs> but now, you know, something happened that disrupted what they were kind of known for. And so, most family dynasties, they don't last beyond the third generation. And particularly in like the business world. But there's one that has kind of stood the test of time so far. And some people might appreciate this in the room a little bit more than others. But, but the Ford family's fifth generation, so the great-great-grandchildren of uh, Ford Motor founder Henry Ford, they're now, among the, they're now among the ranks of the company, according to the Wall Street Journal. This means that there has been five generations of, of Ford family involvement in that business, and it all started with Henry 114 years ago in 1903. Now, why would that last, as opposed to not lasting? Because they're better than Chevy, right? James? Yep. Take that bow tie wearers in the room. But the reason that his family is still involved over a century later is because each generation of that family invested into the next generation. They said, what we're, what we're doing matters. And therefore, it should matter to you as well as somebody that we're, we're leading lives and modeling lives in front of. And sitting here in this room today, you may not have inherited a business, but you ha will have received some kind of a family heirloom from the generation or two above you. You know, perhaps you inherited a certain possession that holds maybe a financial value or a sentimental value that's been passed down from generation to generation. 
and some of you may have intentions of passing down something very special to your children or even your grandchildren. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with handing down material possessions. But understand this. One day, those material possessions will pass away. Someday, like the gold, the silver, it's not going to be there. The house becomes vintage, becomes uh, archaic, and then it becomes rubble when we knock it down. All the things in this world are, are passing away. That's why Jesus encourages us to store up treasures in heaven, and I hope that, that we're doing that. Now, it's not wrong to have stuff, but, but, but to rely on that stuff rather than, than what it is that we're doing to invest in what the kingdom is doing. Because in the kingdom, in heaven, what rusts? What breaks? What disappoints? What gets old? What gets boring? What becomes passe? What is heaven thinking up that's newer and better in the next day? And is there a next day in heaven? But... <laughs> since you're here I want you to understand that we can leave something behind special here on earth because someday I'm going to die I mean maybe Jesus will come back I've been praying about that kind of selfishly it seems like but someday I will pass away and I hope I hope that I have left something that is kind of an indelible mark on the lives of some people I pray that I had some kind of a something to say in how people view their existence how they view the God that created all things I pray that my kids grow up and are strong Christian people There's Wesley will be a, he keeps saying pastor I'm like dude don't do it nope <laughs> don't do it he says farmer policeman fireman or pastor I'm like if you're a pastor you get to be all those things <laughs> I said but, but why don't you look at the other options and we'll pray about it when you get a little bit older but each of us should leave behind a legacy. And in order for us to do this, we have to live our lives in investing in other people. And not only do we have this as an opportunity, it is also our responsibility. It is our responsibility as followers of Jesus Christ to do that. And if we don't, how can we leave behind a legacy? And if we don't, what is our legacy? Because we're going to leave one regardless. Like, I don't want people like, I remember that guy. He was really good at doing nothing. <laughs> oh, he was really good at, you know, trying to maybe make people happy. Or What do you want to be known for? What you want to be known for is, is, is that place that your heart is residing in. What do you want to be known for? That's how you're going to live your life. And if Christ is at the center of that, the legacy is going to be something that looks like a life full of, of, of sharing the good news with people. It's going to, live a, it's going to be a life that you, you look at and say, oh man, so many courses of history were transformed in moments where that person took a step of faith and said, I think God's wanting me to tell this person about Christ. So this morning as we look into the scriptures and consider this core value of reach, if we multiply, we have to understand that in order to pass down in legacy of faith as a local church, we have to be involved in that. We have to be involved in discipleship. And discipleship is more than just evangelism. Discipleship involves evangelism, but it's not evangelism alone. It involves evangelism. It involves teaching. And you're like, I'm not a teacher, Dave. Yes, you are. You teach people stuff every day. What do you teach them? What you're modeling, what you say, what you talk about, what are you most interested in in life? So discipleship involves evangelism and teaching and fellowship. I was just talking to somebody this morning. Man, if we could just be in fellowship more. 
we could just be around each other more. Because if you don't want to be around brothers and sisters in Christ, and you don't like repeating holy, 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 I got news for you. <laughs> Heaven might not be what you think it is. But discipleship is evangelism, teaching, fellowship, and accountability. Where are we at? Where am I at in life? Am I okay being honest with the people around me? Am I okay knowing that they're on my side? They're not here to, to bash me or, 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 or call me all kinds of terrible names or think of all kinds of evil things about me. They're, they're here as the part of the restorative process of what Christ is doing to redeem people. Amen? So this model, this is modeled in Jesus' relationship with his disciples. Jesus called 12 disciples men to follow him remember he said that come and follow me come and follow me and he revealed who he was to them and they recognized him as the messiah and they followed him this is evangelism right follow jesus how do you follow jesus come on here's the good news here's what i'm doing here's where the kingdom is going here's what it's accomplishing come come with me all right that's evangelism. And for more than three years, Jesus never ceased teaching those guys. You think I'm long-winded sometimes. I like the pause there. It's okay to laugh. That was supposed to be a joke. But imagine hanging out with a person for three years and they're non-stop talking about what is most important in their life. Why they are there. What their purpose is. The disciples were present for the Sermon on the Mount, the Olivet Discourse, and many other sermons. And they were also blessed to receive personal instruction from Jesus away from the crowds. That's the teaching. Right? Hey, huddle up. Huddle up. So let's get away from the noise a little bit. Let's go over here. Let's talk a little bit deeper. Teaching. And as they traveled, as the disciples traveled with Jesus... They broke bread together. We get to do that. We get to break some potatoes later. Just don't throw them. Um, we, they got to break bread together often. And they spent precious time together. They developed a closer and deeper relationship with Jesus. This is fellowship. Being in direct presence of what God is doing in the lives of other people. Fellowship. Fellowship is not a hall. Right? Fellowship is not a hall someplace. Fellowship hall, no. Because I've been in fellowship halls where there wasn't a lot of fellowship happening. Fellowship is when you are in that close relational proximity and Christ is at the center. Amen? And there were also times when Jesus had to rebuke his disciples. <laughs> Do you remember the times when he looked at them and probably shook his head a little bit. That's a read-in. The scriptures don't say that, but I'm going to say he was doing some of this. A couple times he looked at them and said, Oh, ye of little faith. Or that time when he looked at Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. This is accountability. Which is much needed. And this discipleship model is also seen in Jesus' relationship with Paul. And this is where we're going to kind of be anchored this morning. And that's where we're going to examine this, this kind of this understanding of how do we multiply into the lives of other people as we are being multiplied out of something from someone else. So in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, and this is uh, Paul writing to a young Christian man, Timothy. He's training him up. He's pouring into him so that Timothy can be on point with the evangelistic early church growth that was happening in the first century. And so this is what, this is what Paul writes in a letter to, to, to this young man, Timothy. He says, You then, my son... Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust 
to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. So in these verses, we we see that somebody is discipling Paul. Who's discipling Paul? Jesus himself. Jesus discipled Paul. Paul then disciples Timothy. And Timothy then disciples certain other people. And those other people disciple other people. And then those people multiplied themselves into other... Can can you see it? One, two, three, then... Right? Let's start here. Jesus discipled Paul. He says, what you have heard from me. What what, what Paul taught others, he learned directly. Now, how how mind-blowing is that? He learns directly from Jesus himself. And, And this is after. This is after he's established his ministry with the Jews, right? Okay, this is after the ascension. How how amazing would that be to be like, Jesus went into heaven, but then he came back to pour into me. Do you, do you think that that calling in Paul's life had a lot of weight to it then? <laughs> oh, man. You came out of heaven twice then? Oh. So what Paul taught others, he learned directly from Jesus himself. And remember, he doesn't have the Gospels to lean on. Right? It's not like, well, I read up on that, so I get it. That There aren't the Gospels yet. They're not penned down. So listen to what he says in Galatians 1, 11 and 12. He says, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the Gospel I preached is not of human origin, I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. People, I was talking to this guy, and, and if you remember to pray from his name is John, and his dad is, has between two and six days to live, and dad has stage four cancer. And he messaged me yesterday, and he said, Dave, I don't know what to do. Like my dad has a few days to live. I don't know if he's going to wake up tomorrow. And I said, "Is he coherent? Is he awake?" He's no, no. And so I said, "You know, let, let me know. Let me know if it's okay if I come over and we'll pray over your dad. I'll pray with you." And he says, "Well, my dad was never a religious man." I said, "Okay. It's nothing to do with religion." He said, it, it, "It's everything to do." with the gospel. It's everything to do with what Christ proclaimed. It's not something somebody came up with. It's not, as Paul says, from human origin. So if you remember, remember to pray for John and his dad. But to continue on, it is likely that this teaching that that uh, Paul received from Jesus or a revelation took place during the, the three years as Paul was journeying around Arabia. And Paul receives no instruction from the apostles. These are the 11 men that Jesus left behind at the ascension. But this is the cool part. When he met up finally, when, when Paul finally meets up, with the people that spent three continuous years with Jesus, when he met the apostles, his gospel was the same gospel. How does that happen? Unless it's divinely appointed to be so. Jesus had a plan for Paul long before he confronted him on the Damascus Road. Listen to this in Acts 9. 15 through 16 says, But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument. So he's talking about Paul. God is speaking into Ananias. And he says, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him much. And he must suffer for my name. 
I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. You see it? Jesus, Jesus said, I will show him how much he will suffer for my name. Don't think about that. Think about that in calling. You know, Jesus is called to be an apostle to the Gentiles and he trained and equipped Paul to do what he had called him to do. And Jesus, think about that, Jesus invested time in him. And there was much time for him to learn and he did not learn it overnight. The Lord spent time teaching him of the crucifixion, of the resurrection, of the ascension. And he taught him many other things throughout the remainder of his life. And Paul spent his days teaching those things to others. And one of those people was Timothy. Timothy. And Paul tells him what you have heard from me. When he's teaching him, he's like, these things that I'm telling you, you have to take note of them. They're very, very, very important. And what did Timothy hear from Paul? If we back up a chapter from the verses we were looking at this morning, we'll see that in 2 Timothy 1.13. And what Paul tells Timothy as he's teaching him, as he's pouring into, as he's telling him the most important things, he says this, he says, What you heard from me, the things I told you, Listen to what he says. Keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. So Paul taught Timothy the doctrines of the Lord. It seemed that Timothy was a, a convert partly as a result of Paul's ministry. He was also set up really well by his grandmother and his mom. But we see that Paul refers to him as his own son, in the faith. And the scriptures reveal Paul's great love and admiration for Timothy. Think of that kind of a closeness, not just in relationship, but also in the pouring into. Paul is taking who he was and what he knew, going and loved on this young man that God had set apart for ministry and said, no, he, I'm, 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 I'm here for you. Everything that you need to know I receive from God I'm going to give it to you so we have Jesus into Paul Paul into Timothy and Timothy he traveled with Paul on his journey through Phrygia and Galatia and Mycenae he went from Troas and Philippi and Berea from Athens Paul then takes Timothy and he sent him to Thessalonica for a while they're traveling together got to mean something, right? How, how do you invest in people? Would you like to take a car ride with me? Yes. Can I spend some time with you? Yes. And later we see Timothy with Paul in Corinth, Ephesus, and in Asia. And near the end of his life, as Paul was in prison, he wrote to Timothy requesting him to join him. See the continue. There's a continual going back to Paul, making not just another disciple, but an, almost like another Paul. He's continually wanting to affirm who God created him to, as a believer to be. And then he said, "Timothy, I want you to do the same things that I am doing." Oh, and by the way, I'm getting ready to die. I'm in prison. Can you come and join me? So you see the investment, and then what is the return on it? You think Timothy is like, I'm not going to jail. I don't want to hang out there. Paul sought his companionship, and he requested that Timothy bring certain items to him. And listen to this. It is believed that after Paul was killed for the cause of Christ, Timothy settled in Ephesus, and he ministered, the church history says this, he, was, he ministered there until he was martyred himself. So I kind of share that brief biography in order to show all of the time that these guys, they spent together. As they journeyed throughout the region doing the Lord's work, you see Paul's intentional investment into Timothy. And his desire was that Timothy then do the same for other people. So after all of this time, after all of this investment 
from Christ into Paul and Paul into Timothy. Timothy was well prepared for the ministry that God had laid out in front of him. But he did not gain his knowledge by sitting in some seminary. Not that seminary is bad. But he learned by being mentored by one of the greatest. I'm going to say this. I know there's a quality within how God views the kingdom. But I'm going to say that he was mentored by one of the greatest Christians that ever lived. I mean, the guy that was persecuting and breathing murderous threats against the church and killing, you know, hey, kill Christians, all right. He went from that to, oh man, I found I was actually persecuting Christ in that. I can't do, I can't do this anymore. And then his eyes were opened up and he really understood who God was at that moment. Paul then, I'm going to say it, one of the greatest probably Christians then says, oh, by the way, Timothy, I think you can do what I do. God said you could do what I'm currently doing in ministry. And when you see Paul investing, there's not, I'm, not, I'm not going against classroom situations, but it's this, this, this daily kind of bringing people along into your sphere of influence into the lives of other people and say, now watch this. Now let's talk about this. Let's, let's go do some more. And so Timothy, he received first-hand on-the-job training. I can just imagine as they were like sitting around campfires at night, Paul's still teaching Timothy the ways of the Lord. And like when they broke bread together, I bet you Paul taught them the precious doctrine of Christ. And Timothy was there listening and learning, and he, he didn't just read of everything in Paul's life, the persecution, the opposition that Paul endured, he witnessed it firsthand. So he knew what he was getting into. Jesus spent time training Paul for the work of the ministry. Likewise, Paul invested time t training Timothy to do the work in ministry. And Paul's end goal was for Timothy to take what he had learned and train others. And that's just what he did. We see that in the text this morning. Paul tells Timothy, And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. See the progression there? Jesus to Paul. Paul passed it down to Timothy. Timothy passed it on to certain faithful people. And we're told that these are... We're not told who these faithful people are. And it's not important necessarily who they are outside of the fact that it said that they were faithful in what was handed down to them. And it's plural. It's because discipleship isn't about addition to the kingdom. It's about multiplication. So when you make a disciple and you have them learn what that means and then you free them up. So now you have two people discipling. And if you each disciple someone else again, you have four. And then four goes into I want to do the math. Eight. Sixteen. Do we peak there? Is it thirty-two? Sixty-four? One twenty-eight. And that's just assuming you're only discipling one person at a time. You see how the church exploded in the first century. Because of the intentionality of what God was doing. In faithful people to see multiplication in the kingdom. And Paul spent a bunch of time investing Timothy, but he also trained Titus, Silas, a whole bunch of other people. And each of those men took what they had learned and they discipled other people. And just as Paul had invested into Timothy, Timothy found certain faithful people and taught them what it meant to follow after Jesus Christ. He invested in them, he worked with them, and he trained them. And the purpose of Timothy training them is so that they could then carry on this process of spiritual reproduction and seeing the kingdom expand. You see it? You get down a couple layers. And you start seeing the true investment that the, the one or two people were making at the top. So it wasn't just the beneficiaries of them just the next level down it was 
if you look into the future, if you could do that and you see how the consuming generations are impacted and affected by what God did back here, you'll start seeing then the, 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 the true impact. You know, the people that Timothy and Paul discipled, they discipled other people. They multiplied themselves in other people. That's what it says in the scripture. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. So the men who were taught by Timothy, they continued the process. What did they do? It was simple. They obeyed the Great Commission. Right? The great, I, there was a study done recently, I don't know how accurate it is because it's polling and you never know about how accurate polling is, but um, the study said that uh, of evangelical Christians in America, 51% didn't know what the Great Commission was. That's where you all go. <laughs> so o over half of the people polled, and it was Barna or Pew or whatever, but they didn't know what that was. The Great Commission, we see that in Matthew 28. 19 and 20, the Great Commission. This is Jesus speaking. Again, this is what Paul is also receiving from him. I'm sure in what Jesus discipled him in. But he says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you and surely I, I am with you always to the very end of the age so all these faithful guys all these faithful people that are being poured into, invested in, multiplied into, here's what happened, they went out and they shared the gospel of Jesus Christ they pointed people to the Savior and the Holy Spirit then convicted the people then of why they should follow the gospel like you have sin in your life you're separated from God because of that. Do you want to be under that? Do you want to be set free to actually live the way God intended in this life and in the next? They went out and told people that. And the Holy Spirit convicted those people of their sins. And some of those people, they trusted Christ as their Savior. And these people who had given themselves to the ministry, baptized them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. But unlike most churches today, I fear to say, they did not stop when they got them in the water. They carried out the Great Commission. They taught those new converts the doctrine of Christ. And more than just teaching them, they invested in them. They trained them and continued the process. They trained them to multiply into others. And that's just what they did. And maybe you're, you're kind of sitting here like, I'm kind of curious as to what kind of happened next right because we only have so much information within the canon within the scriptures you know maybe you'd like to know like how did the message travel how did that get out who are the people that were affected by it and changed by it and transformed by it perhaps you're interested in how many people were, re were reached with this process of discipleship and multiplication and I could I can maybe come up with some rough estimates on that for an answer but I think it would just be easier for me to show you okay you ready look around look around the fruit of the generations of, of spiritual labor is here <laughs> think about that we're removed by half of a world if it's round or flat who cares right we're separated by half of a world in 2,000 years. We're in a different culture. We're in a different era. And the gospel, the same one that Jesus hands to the, the disciples, the, the same one that he hands and pours into Paul is still at play here. It's still moving forward. It's still transforming lives. It's still saving people from their sins. And it's bringing people into a renewed sense of the purpose of why they exist as created by a good, loving God. You know, when somebody discipled us, you know, 
know, the, the people sitting in here in this room, if you're a Christian, it's it, that's only possible because of the, the faithful service of generations of Christians. Each of us, like if you're sitting and you're redeemed today, you owe a debt of gratitude to those who are willing to obey Christ's command to go out. Step out of where you are. Go find people. Go find the lost. Go find the lonely. Go find the, the dejected. Go find those that are hopeless. Go find those people and make disciples of Jesus Christ. And the truth is we have many different people who have invested in our lives and God has placed certain people in our path in order for them to help point us back to Him. And I'm thankful that God placed people in my life that were willing to do that for me. But as Christians, it is our responsibility to go make disciples. And it's not only our responsibility, but hear me say this. It's not, an, it's not that we're just obligated to do this. Because we are. Because our Lord and Savior and Master said in no uncertain terms to go do this. And Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. But over that, it's not only something that we are without choice of doing. It's a privilege. I was talking to somebody the other day. I'm like, you've been there when somebody like like they, they, they were just enlivened by the Spirit. Like they, they were born again in the Spirit. Like you've, you've been there. I was like, you, you tell me where there's like a greater moment than that. Like I, I remember seeing our kids born. That was awesome, but not but. That was awesome. And when you're there for like new life in Christ... We didn't just usher somebody into temporal existence. We brought somebody into eternity with God. An eternity saved out of the other option of eternity. Think of the privilege that we have to be able to do that. And Jesus made it clear that when that cleared it clear what we were to do and that he would empower us to do. You ever feel like you're kind of alone in that? Oh, man, God, they're not going to listen to me. Yeah, you're right. They probably won't. But we don't go alone, do we? In Acts 1.8, it says, Jesus to the, talking to the, the disciples, he says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. In fact, we are not bringing God with us. We are going with him where he takes us, where he calls us into, he is supernaturally preparing for what is going to happen next through us and in the lives of other people. And it's that simple. We're supposed to be witnesses of Jesus Christ. That's why we are here. Many people think that Jesus died so that we could go to heaven. You know, if that's the case, why are we not translated into heaven the moment we are converted? fact is we have all been saved and it's for the purpose of serving God and loving other people and as long as you walk on this earth Jesus calls you to point people to him that's what we have to do point people to the Savior he will do the saving <laughs> is that nice that's kind of off our shoulders I was talking to somebody a while ago. Dave, you got to go save those people. Like, <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah, I could, I, I couldn't save myself. I can't save anybody else. God saves. We just point people towards Him, and once He saves them, then we can help them grow and mature in the faith. And our part in this process begins with simply being a witness who bears witness to the truth. So we just go out and we share the truth with people. Okay. For all have sinned. Right? Everybody's sinned. 
falling short of the glory of God. And you can't live a good enough life. How many times do you hear that? Why should you go to heaven? Because I'm a good person. Well, how good do you have to be to get in? I don't know. Then I wouldn't bet on that. Titus 3, 5 says, It's not because of righteous things we have done that we get into heaven, but it's because of the mercy of God. Let me tell people, you know, you have to believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died for your sins. Romans 5, 8. And then trust in Christ and in Him alone for salvation. The sacrifice of Christ does no one any good until they have received Him by faith, until they trust Him, until they believe in Him. And at that point, they're saved. And if people do this, people will be saved, and then those people get to be part of that lineage. <laughs> they get to be part of the the, 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 the generation then that has the, the, the ability then to pour into the, the people around them and underneath them you start, you start watching it it's a continual process of people are born but they're born into a messed up screwed up sinful world and we're on this mission to help redeem people through what God has done and when you see them and they get saved by God they're co-opted into it you've seen it right then they're on point for all the stuff we just talked about multiplication and so there's multiplication a lot of different ways within the church you know as we we build people up to support them in ministry it's like hey you like 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 sue slash mom was saying you too could even just greet people at the door i'm doing this already let me help you do this or tom's back there working computer stuff he's like hey i'm doing this but like you know you can do this too that supports the body that supports the mission and purpose of the church it's within the body, but the main focus is to go out and, and just tell people the truth. Tell people about what God has done so that they can be redeemed from the sin in their life, which is eternally separating them from God. And so, as we kind of close things out this morning, it's, it's, it's perfectly wonderful to, to be able to celebrate the Lord's Supper. And so... Uh, this morning as we do this we you don't have to be a member of reach church to participate in the in the lord's supper but we ask that you are seeking god out because without that it's just a little bit of bread and a little bit of juice which doesn't mean anything and the bread and the juice if you take it they're not magic bread or magic juice and they don't save you but they point us towards and help us to remember the one that did save us and so I'm going to have a word of prayer. Tom's going to start a, a video that sings a very beautiful song, helping us to remember Christ's sacrifice on the cross for us. And then we're just, just feel free to come up and receive the elements. When you come up, just take a piece of the bread and tear it away from the hole. And that's a good kind of visceral way of remembering Christ's body literally broken for you. And then take that piece of bread and dip it in the cup. And that's symbolic and helps us remember the blood that came out of Jesus. His whole body was emptied of all the blood on the cross. And so after prayer, please come up and receive the elements. Hold them and we'll take them together. Remember what Christ has done for us. Dear Lord, we thank you for seeing fit to call us into places, Lord, and as members of your body, as people that are part of the called out ones, part of the church, God, I, I pray that we have this in front of us and have it in our minds and have it on our hearts all the time. Lord, that where we go, we're, we're, we're always trying to draw people to you, and Lord, give us discernment and wisdom on how to do that. But Lord, help us to to, to follow through on what you have called us into. Lord, help us to identify those people that we, we need to go to to pour into and invest so that we can see a whole new generation of believers come up because of your faithfulness to us and our faithfulness to you. And God, this morning, 
as we remember your sacrifice in Calvary where you died for us where you died the death that we deserve so that we can live the life that we never could apart from you God help us to remember that today and God as we do that as we proclaim who you are your life, death resurrection, ascension and coming again Lord may we bring new hope into the lives of people around us as we continually go out and just live this in front of them so God we thank you again for this opportunity to remember what you did for us and God we just want to be more like your son Jesus every day of our lives and Lord I just pray these things in his name through the power of your Holy Spirit Amen come up and receive the, the elements.